Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 2019 Town of Granby Board of Education Forum. Tonight you will hear from seven of the candidates running to be elected for the Granby Board of Education. In coordination with the Town of Granby Registrar of Voters, graduating senior students in Mr. Nembrowski's Honor Civics class have prepared topics and questions for the candidates to discuss in a forum, forum setting this evening. Before we go over the rules and protocols, can we please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? We pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. In the event of an emergency, exits are located in the front and rear of the auditorium. I would also like to remind you all to silence your cell phones. Tonight's rules for the forum are as follows. Each candidate has received a copy of the topics and questions in advance for tonight's forum. However, they do not know which questions they will receive. Candidates have been grouped in tables alphabetically, and each candidate has prepared an opening statement. The moderators will ask each table a question, and each candidate at the table will have 90 seconds to respond to the question. One person from each of the other two tables will be able to give a response no longer than 45 seconds. If the audience has a question they want to ask, please fill out the um, form located in the back of the room and leave it on the table that says questions. If time permits, we will ask the questions. This is not a debate and is designed to be a discussion of ideas and most importantly, the educational future of our children and young adults. We ask that you hold your applause to the end of the forum to help keep this forum nonpartisan and keep to our time restraints. At the conclusion of tonight's forum, candidates are asked to remain on stage if they would like to participate in interviews with their student journalists. The candidates running for the Board of Education, and if you would mind raising your hand so everybody knows who you are, um, Jenny Emery, Mark Fiorentino, Lynn Gelzo, Monica Logan, Christine Peasley, David Pelling, and Rose Marie Weber. Thank you and good luck to all the candidates. Go Bears. Jenny Emery, you will start with the opening statements. Thank you very much. And thanks to the students in the class. You've put together some great questions. I want to answer all of them. Um, for my two-minute statement, I was thinking back in 1992, my husband Dave and I were looking to buy our first home in, somewhere in the Farmington Valley, and we were told to stay away from Granby, that the town didn't support its schools, that its facilities were falling apart. And we could do much better than that. But we had a neighbor who was a substitute teacher who had worked in all of the schools. And she said her favorite place to work was, Gran was Granby because it had the best people. She said the teachers are the best, the kids are the best, the parents are supportive. And because of that, we chose Granby and we've never looked back. This morning, in thinking about what I wanted to say, I remembered, uh, I, I was thinking about being non-ideological and leaders who step up and help out in their local community. And it, I was reminded of an event that happened back in 1987. Couldn't remember the details, so I googled um, uh, hemophiliac child with AIDS in Granby, Connecticut. And up popped a New York Times article written at the time, uh, the title of which was, For a Nine-Year-Old Dying of AIDS, An Act of Decency in a Small Town. You should really read it. Um, I did post it in Granby Living, but you can just Google like I did and find it. And uh, my real, I don't, won't go into the story here, but my point is that after serving these past eight years on the Board of Ed, we are still the Granby that's described in that story. We face tough decisions, we balance competing interests, we gather information, and we try to do the right thing. I'm grateful for the opportunity to have served Granby these past eight years, and I'd be honored to continue. I hope some of tonight's discussion will help some of you choose to honor me with your vote on November 4th. Thank you. Where did Ellie go? <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming, and I wanted to join uh, Jenny in thanking all of the students and Mr. Dombrowski. You guys did a, a great job. Um, 
around my household, I've become famous for saying the world is kind of broken and it's this generation needs to fix it and we're in very good hands. So thank you very much for doing this for us. So our experience when we decided to move to Granby is a little bit different. Uh, we moved here from Las Vegas a um, little over 10 years ago and we moved here because of the reputation that the school district had for being a very, very good one. Um, and I'm very proud of that, and I'm very proud um, that in the six years or so that I've served on the board, uh, we still hear that. We still hear it regularly that when you ask uh, young families why they're moving to Granby, if not the only reason they give, one of the primary reasons is um, our school district. And so I've served for six years now. I've uh, been the vice chairman for the last two years, and I'm running for re-election because I want to try to uh, help uh, continue that legacy. Um, two things, because I may not get asked this question that I think I bring to the board. Um, first is a personality thing. For those of you that know me or have watched me on the board, I don't take myself very seriously. Um, I take the job very seriously. I take our responsibilities very seriously. But what that means is I'm not afraid to ask the dumb question. Um, in fact, I'm not afraid to ask it three or four different times until I make sure I understand the answer and affords me the ability to kind of methodically go through the issues that we face um, every day to uh, try to help find good solutions. The other thing I think you'll find is just a philosophy. Um, one of the reasons we do such a great job in Granby is it's sort of a bottom-up organization. That's, those are my words. Uh, I think we do a pretty good job on the board of staying in our lane. Um, what that means is, is we recognize our responsibility is to set the goals and objectives, to set the tone, and then we have a wonderful, wonderful team of people that we ask, we empower to implement it, and we hold them accountable in their efforts to implement it. So if you reelect me, you're just going to get more of that. Thank you. Good evening. Can you guys all hear me? Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Before I begin, I also want to thank Mr. Dombrowski and his students um, and the town registrars for all of the time they put into putting this forum together. It's really great to see Granby's young adults getting so involved and in leading us into the future. Um, my name is Lynn Gelzo and I'm running for re-election for the Board of Education. Uh, you could say that I have public education in my DNA. I am the child of two teachers. My dad was a high school science teacher. My mom was an elementary classroom teacher. My sister is now an elementary classroom teacher in Arizona. Our family conversations at Thanksgiving and Christmas are almost always centered around public education, its issues, um, and the trends. It's something I've thought a lot about, but I admit to a certain teacher bias. I've seen public education through the eyes of teachers and more recently as a parent for my entire life, but I think that's a pretty good bias to have. I grew up in rural Wisconsin, and I attended public schools. I eventually got my law degree from UW-Madison. I practice in the area of international competition law and in the developing world. I'm very grateful for the public education I received that gave me opportunities I could not have dreamed of when I was a high school student, like many of you are here tonight. I lived in Granby for 22 years. I have three kids. They've all attended Granby public schools at one time or another. My youngest just graduated from Granby in 2018. When my son first started at Kern School, I volunteered as a drummer reporter, um, and I did that for almost 10 years, covering the Board of Education. Then I became a Board of Ed member, so basically I've been covering or attending Board of Education meetings for about 18 years, which is as long as most of you have been alive. So that might make me a little bit crazy, but it also gives me a very deep understanding of Granby's education system, where we've been, and where we're going. <clears throat> From my experience, I know that the two greatest strengths of the Granby schools are our students and our teachers. As a board member, my major focus has always been on curriculum and supporting our teachers in the classroom. Those have been and always will be my main priorities. Public education will continue to change. We face a lot of challenges. We're hiring a new superintendent, and that's going to bring change to Granby. Our budget is always tight and our enrollment is dropping. These next four years will require your board to make very difficult decisions about the public schools. As your representative, 
I will always listen to you, the students, the parents, and the community. Together, we're gonna to keep our schools strong, and remember that it's the quality of our students that we produce that matters the most. Thank you so much. Good evening. Uh, first and foremost, I wanna say, as a parent of two young children, I'm very excited to have two minutes of time allotted to me where no one can interrupt. So <laughs> this is really a special moment for me, and I'm gonna enjoy every second of it. Uh, I live in West Granby with my husband, uh, Matt Peters, and our two boys, William, who is five years old, and he's currently enrolled at Kelly Lane in Miss Ferrari's class, who's been absolutely magical, I gotta say. And Alexander is our four-year-old, uh, Xander, as we call him. He'll be starting kindergarten at Kelly, Kelly Lane next year. We moved to West Granby about three and a half years ago. We are transplants from Illinois. Um, prior to that, I did live in, El or live in Connecticut for several years, both in Avon uh, and in Simsbury. We chose Granby to live in, uh, primarily because of the schools, because of the attitude of the people, and the general atmosphere of the town. We looked at this place and said, this is where we want to raise our children. I attended DePaul University for undergraduate, and then I majored in political science. I went on to UIC John Marshall Law School in Chicago, where I focused my studies in trial advocacy and negotiation and resolution strategies. If it wasn't for my public school education and my incredible teachers and coaches, particularly mock trial coaches, I probably wouldn't have gone that direction. So I always felt an extreme closeness to those coaches, those people who helped mold uh, my future. Uh, I currently work uh, at TDC Specialty Insurance in Unionville. Prior to that, I uh, worked uh, at Chubb Specialty Insurance, where I specialized in complex specialty claims. Essentially, I trained for years to solve tough problems um, and to find middle grounds in situation and work on negotiation and working with tough people and making tough decisions. Over the past few years, I've noticed a distressing pattern spread nationwide of major distrust in elected officials. And I want to bring back some transparency, some communicativeness, the ability to talk to uh, our citizens or let residents feel like they're being heard. Um, and I'm running for the Board of Education because I am passionate that every child receive a quality education. Education is at the base of success for every person in our community, school-aged or not. And I want to help bring that trust back in our elected officials in our community. Thank you. Good evening. And thank you for having me here tonight. My name is Christine Peasley, and I have been a Granby resident for about 20 years. I have three children, two who are grown and graduated from Granby Memorial School a few years ago and are now out in the real world blazing their paths, and one who is currently a fourth grader at um, Wells Road School. So I think I bring a rather unique uh, perspective of a parent who's witnessed the progression of two older children, um, their successful paths through the Granby schools, and their postgraduate lives, we're going through that now, and I've also seen, you know, I'm experiencing the life of an elementary school student in the here and now, in 2019, there's almost a 10 year difference. So I've seen the school system back then, and I see it now. And I can tell you that from this parental perspective that I've seen over the past 10 years, the Granby schools have really changed um, for the better. And I've been so impressed. Um, I followed the Board of Education tangentially throughout the time, and I think that the reason the schools are so strong, in my view, and the change has been so dramatic, is because of the quality of this board. I think this board is exceptional um, and has really done a terrific job elevating the reputation of the Granby schools. Um, I do think all boards can occasionally benefit from a fresh pair of eyes, so when this opportunity came up, I, you know, I wanted to explore the possibility and be a part of um, such a really high-functioning organization. Um, regarding my background and experience, I am by trade a finance lawyer. I worked for about eight years at a Hartford law firm uh, until I switched career paths and became corporate secretary for Mass Mutual Life Insurance Company in Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, I did that for about seven years, working very closely with the board of directors and really managing all the company's corporate governance. 
Um, around that time, I was also chairperson of the board for Mass Mutual Federal Credit Union for seven years, um, and also more recently served two years as assistant treasurer and assistant secretary for the Granby PTO. So I have a lot of experience on boards, um, both informal and sort of uh, Fortune 100 corporate boards. I have a lot of experience, um, you know, meeting in the middle, negotiating, um, and I've seen my way around a lot of budgets, especially being on the Federal Credit Union Board, so I feel like I can add some value here. Um, I want to also just make a little note, I know you've talked about this before, I'm sure, but I'm not currently a member of the Board of Directors, so or Board of um, Education, so I know my responses to a lot of these questions will not be as informed or as comprehensive as the other members, so um, please be gentle with me. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is David Pelling, and I am also a new candidate for the Board of Education. Uh, basically, I decided to run this year because uh, I've been working in education for 27 years. Uh, I started teaching at Hall High School in 1994 as a social studies teacher. I did that for about 20 years. I then went into administration for seven years, or I was principal of East Granby High School and later Avon High School. I've since returned to teaching. Um, but uh, working with children has been a passion of mine uh, basically since I started in high school when I was a swimming coach in 1982. So I think I have something like 36 years of experience working with young people. And we, like everybody else here, we also moved to Granby because of the terrific reputation of the schools. Some of our colleagues from Hall High School lived out here and were raising their children here. And when we came out and visited and got to know the community uh, 15 years ago, my wife Colleen and I moved out here with our daughter Madeline. And uh, we also have a son, David, who's in uh, fifth grade. So I think that what I would probably bring that would be unique to the board would be that professional experience and as a high school administrator I often thought you know it'd be really great if there were some folks over on the board who had spent some time in the classroom and it's not that other perspectives aren't valuable uh, but sometimes having that in the classroom experience or having been a high school principal uh, I think that that would be a, a unique quality that I would bring to the board and I hope to get your vote thank you And last, good evening everyone. Um, my name is Rosemary Weber and I want to first uh, echo the sentiments of my fellow candidates and just thank the students and Mr. Dombrowski for putting this forum together. I think it is a valuable public service and I appreciate the time and effort that you've put into this. Um, I have lived in town for the last 15 years with my family, which consists of my husband, Chris. Um, if you have a horse or a cow, you may know him. And I have three children, Christopher, Benjamin, and Jennifer, uh, all three Granby Bears. Um, as a parent and a taxpayer, I understand the value of a strong public education. I am the product of public education. And after attending my public high school, I attended the University of Pennsylvania, and when I graduated, I was also commissioned a second lieutenant in the United States Army, and I served on active duty for several years before attending law school. As a lawyer, I've focused my professional life on the protection of children. I am a child protection attorney for the state of Connecticut, and as such, I interface with uh, teachers and psychologists and social workers on a regular basis whose sole mission is to ensure uh, that our children are safe and that they are successful and able to be their best selves. And, and that is my passion as well. But when I hung up my uniform, I promised myself that it would not be the only time that I served my country or my community. And so when we did move to Granby, I volunteered uh, for several organizations, uh, the Granby Drummer, one of them. And then for the last 10 years, I've been honored to serve as a member of Granby's Board of Education. Uh, the last six years, I believe, I've been the chair of the curriculum subcommittee. And for the last year, I've served as the board's chair, um, excuse me, <clears throat> secretary. When I saw my son cross the stage and I handed him his diploma, uh, this past June and saw 170 of his fellow classmates 
across the stage, I realized the importance of the decisions that we make uh, as a Board of Education, uh, whether uh, you attend college as most do, or you are entering military service, or entering the job force. What we do here in our schools matters, and it sets our kids and our young adults up for success in life. I think Granby schools are great, and I think our students are the best, and I am honored to serve them. And I hope to continue doing so, um, and I ask for your support on November 5th. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move right into questions. So we're gonna skip forward in the slideshow to the budget section of our questions. Just to reiterate what Ellie said earlier, each question is going to be asked to a table and each member at that table is going to have 90 seconds to respond to the question. After that, we will open the question up to the other tables and if one member from the other table would like to add anything or give an additional response, they will have 45 seconds to do so. Does anyone have any questions about the format? Okay, so we're going to start with a budget question for table one, which is farthest over there. And this question is, should the Board of Education continue to promote musical literacy in foreign languages at the elementary level? Jenny Emery, you will have 90 seconds to respond to this question. Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, I'm looking for my specific notes on this, which I probably can't find. Um, the uh, musical literacy and foreign language is part of a 21st century education. There is very clear um, research and evidence that ties uh, language learning, critical thinking, and all kinds of other aptitudes that we're trying to instill in our kids, especially at an early age, to music and foreign language education. Um, I only know that because our uh, paid professionals bring us these issues and explain them to us and show us the research and then we can do our own research. But that, uh, uh, you know, Dave may be an education professional, but I am not an education professional. We have a lot of them, and they have shown very clear evidence that this is a critical part of, of a full, rounded education for the kids. The other point I want to make about that, this issue, is that it is uh, something we should look at through an equity lens. Kids have always been rewarded for being good at reading, writing, and arithmetic. Um, but we've got a lot of diversity in Granby amongst our kids, different kinds of diversity, diversity in what they're good at and what they can learn. And I want to be able to offer them, uh, those that have those kinds of skills, to let those skills shine just as much as the one who can write a good report. Okay, thank you. Um, Mark Fiorentino, you will now have 90 seconds to respond as well. So you want me to answer the same question? <laughs> I sure? do. <laughs> you sure you don't want to ask me a different one? <laughs> I'm sure. All right. So it's hard to add anything to that, because my answer, again, would also be yes. Um, uh, as long as we're achieving the proper balance. Uh, I was a little skeptical, actually, when I joined the board. Um, it was when the, we were beginning discussions about how far down, in, in terms of the grade levels, we should do um, the language instruction. And I was a little skeptical, but this is a good example of what we were talking about earlier. Um, this is. The, the goals and objectives that we set to our professionals, our administrators, and our teachers were to provide a well-rounded education, and their recommendation was to provide this instruction, and um, I think it's working. And uh, it's our job to continue to make sure that it's working, and it's working efficiently, so. Okay, thank you. Does anyone from table two have anything they would like to add? You don't need to if you think that they've covered it. <laughs> that you know this is probably all uh, it's all up to our budget right I mean if we had an, a, a large budget we could put as many programs or activities as we want for the kids I have a son in fourth grade and he's playing the drums he's speaking Spanish I'm so proud of him and I, I think we need to continue those opportunities for children okay thank you anyone at table three do you have anything you would like to add no okay. yes oh okay <laughs> Yeah, I would just, I would also agree, and uh, I had an opportunity to 
teach English in both uh, China and Russia, and typically um, early elementary grades, and it was really stunning how advanced their English was. And I think that sometimes here in the United States, we underestimate what our young people are capable of doing and learning. And I, I think that continuing to support languages in the elementary grades is a great idea. Okay, thank you. Well, if I, and if I could just add one more thing. I did, I did have a thought. Um, several years ago on the board, um, our administration uh, brought us a, 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 an audit of our music program and also an initiative uh, to enhance the STEM or STEAM um, portion of the curriculum and that um, would include music and we uh, specifically included arts and music in STEAM because it supports the well-rounded education and they're very complementary toward one another so the administration did bring that to us and we were able to uh, implement that in our curriculum in the following budgets. Okay, thank you. The next question will be directed to table two. Do you think that the Board of Education does and should prioritize athletics over extracurriculars such as robotics, DECA, the business club we have here at the high school, drama, et cetera? Ms. Skelzo, you have 90 seconds to answer. Thank you. That's a really great question. Um, I don't think the Board does prioritize athletics over. We certainly have a lot of kids participating in athletics in the high school. I think we have um, well over 300 kids um, playing at least one sport. And so that's clearly something that kids in Granby value. We do a, a sports survey every year, um, and that's uh, sports are, are definitely a big part of education. It is not the only part of an education. And as you said, things like DECA, drama, um, our drama program is phenomenal. These, these are programs we need to support. We might want to try to support them more. It's a balance. Um, it's a tough balance. Um, as we see enrollment declining and our budgets uh, being having very small increases, almost certainly we will have to make difficult decisions in the future, particularly with respect to sports and extracurriculars. But I think that all of those things are, are really important to kids. Um, but we need to, when we're making those hard decisions, particularly which sports we're going to, you know, support them more than, than others, the real question is what do the kids want? And so that's why that survey is so fundamentally important and it does inform our, our decisions. So I, I don't think I'm going to make the decision. Let's put more money into football. Let's pour money into to drama. My question is going to be, kids, what do you guys want? And, and that's where we're going to want to put the money. Thank you. Ms. Logan, 90 seconds. I don't think that the board necessarily prior prioritizes sports over academics, but I do think we as a society generally do. Um, I, I think that, that a, a lot is invested into, into sports, and I think there's a value to that. Um, it promotes unity. It promotes athleticism. It promotes expanding the brain in a variety of different ways, all very important. Um, at the same time, I believe academic teams need uh, additional support, uh, personally. Um, I think uh, they're not given the same kudos as many athletic teams. Uh, at the same time, I don't think that that's the doing of the board here. I think that's a, a product of, of, of what we value uh, within our society. Um, building upon what Lynn said, it really is about what what benefit is given to the kids? What, what do the kids feel will give them the greatest reward? And, and that's where the investment should primarily be as far as how to spend the board's money or the town's money in investing in those particular extracurricular activities. If they all have value. What gives the most value to the, to the students? Thank you very much. Ms. Peasley, the same question to you. So I agree with um, everything Lynn and Monica just said. I don't think the board should prioritize um, athletics over um, um, extracurriculars. <clears throat> um, I, I don't know that it does. I haven't been party to those discussions. But I can tell you that my two older children graduated um, four and two years ago uh, were heavily involved in athletics. As a parent, I never thought that the school emphasized athletics over over extracurriculars at all. Um, so I did not have that impression. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Does anyone have uh, from table three have anything to add? No. Um, I will just add that we on the Board of Education have a student rep uh, and uh, our new student rep, Jack DeGray, reported to us just this past week that um, I think he said about 40% of uh, students are involved in one shape, uh, in one form or another, um, in ac extracurricular activities, um, specifically athletics. Um, and I don't know that the board necessarily uh, supports one over the other. I think we like to see a balance. Um, but when I went to the football game on Friday night, I saw why both music and sports are equally valuable and how they don't have to be mutually exclusive because the football players played a great game against Ellington and our, um, and our band was playing and supporting them and I think the fans were cheering on the football team uh, and the band uh, equally. So it was a really nice community event and it was really nice to see both athletics and music shining. Thank you very much. Does anyone from table one have something to add? Absolutely do not prioritize one over the other. And that's in listening to what we are told the needs are. So when the, the drama department comes and says we need X, Y, and Z, we give that equal attention as to when the sports teams may say we need X, Y, and Z. Um, we can't always afford all of them, but we give them equal attention and consideration. There's, there's no doubt about that, and we wanted to make sure that was clear. Yeah, and I'd like to take that one step further. Um, I have a strong bias against the term extracurricular. Um, nothing feels extra to me anymore. It feels to me like all the opportunities that are provided through the Granby Public Schools, many of which we couldn't do without the volunteers in this town who step up, both in the athletic programs and in robotics, through GEF and the funding that happens. That is part of the education we give our kids. And uh, it's not a matter of prioritization of one over the other. It's a, it's a matter of are there champions around? Are there kids that are interested? And will this help make them uh, better 21st uh, century citizens? And um, it, it's a perfect example of where it does take a village. And we have a village that offers a lot to our kids. Thank you very much. OK. Directing this question to table three. Should the Board of Education consider offering free pre-K to all residents instead of the current lottery-based slash pay tuition that is used today? Mr. Pelling, you have 90 seconds to answer. If we had unlimited funds, sure. <laughs> but uh, regrettably, that's not the case. And so I think that um, while well, offering it for some families where there might be a need for that kind of assistance uh, on a limited basis is probably actually not appropriate but necessary. Uh, if it were up to me on the board, I would think that maybe spending those dollars in other areas like additional faculty, extra, extra, extra curricular activities, supporting those kinds of things would be a better use of that money for our town. Uh, so no, I would not support universal pre-K. Thank you. And Mrs. Weber, you also have 90 seconds. Thank you. Um, that would be a very expensive proposition that I don't think our budget could support. Um, and not only that, the program isn't great for all kids. Um, so I think each family needs to look at what the needs of their uh, children are and their families are in terms of uh, what type of pre-K program is best for them. Um, when we did uh, develop and integrate the integrated pre-K program into uh, our schools, we were very mindful um, that we didn't want to put our other uh, daycares and um, preschools that are in town, those businesses out of business because they serve a very important um, purpose in our, in our communities. So um, no, I wouldn't support that. I don't think our budget could support that and I think it would um, also um, negatively impact um, our local businesses and families. Okay, thank you. Would anyone from table one like to add? Yeah, I, I would, I'd offer that um, when I first joined the board, the issue of whether we could, should go to all day kindergarten was on the table. 
and the debate was could we afford it or not um, and ultimately the answer was we can't afford not to it's basically we need this time with the kids um, it's taking more than uh, 12 and a half years to uh, provide an adequate public education we probably needed to go longer at the other end and and start earlier um, so I'm not interested on in being on the bleeding edge of this but I would say that I would be very surprised if Granby and the board are not considering how to manage this issue in the future and uh, looking to the state um, and and the federal government for for guidance and that sooner or later we will be educating the kids I believe when they're at a younger age thank you anyone from table two sure. <laughs> um, the the basic philosophy is that we've got to provide for right now K through 12, and we're struggling to do that. Um, you guys brought up an earlier question about music and foreign language, which I don't feel we've adequately resourced um, currently. So I can't imagine supporting another huge major program when we haven't done a really great job of supporting the programs we've already got. Um, we want to grow that strings program. We want to grow our um, Chinese, we want to grow the Spanish and the French, which shows the research is so overwhelmingly in support of. Um, Pre-K is, is not there, we can't afford it, um, and if we had the money, I would really want to put it into our existing programs that I don't feel we've quite come up with um, the money to support currently. Thank you. Okay, um, we are now moving into our equity section. The first question is directed at table one, and it is uh, what, sh what support is slash should be available to students who don't plan on continuing to college? Jenny Emery, you have 90 seconds to respond. I have to go first every time. Can we make Mark go first? I um, I'll go first. We need to do better in this area. So one of the questions was um, one of the things that would I prioritize if I was reelected? This is one of the three things that I made a note about. Um, when I joined the board six years ago, uh, since then we've done things. We've um, partnered with Asnuntuck on some programming and they provided some equipment and curriculum to us. Our college fair is not truly a college fair anymore. Um, there are other institutes and, and opportunities that are presented to the kids during that. So we've, we've, we've started some things, but this is something that we need to do more of. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how to do it. Um, I've talked recently actually with uh, Chris, our assistant superintendent, about uh, two ideas that I just aren't mine, I stole. There's one, uh, there's an article you might have seen in the Hartford Current uh, maybe 30 days ago that talked about how United Technology and some of their unions are working on programs to get out in the schools, introducing kids to alternative careers as machinists and and other types of things. Those are the kind of things that are available to us that I think we have to do a, a better job of tapping into. Thank you. Uh, you see, that way I don't, I don't have to take up as much time because I, I, I agree with Mark. Um, this is an area of concern. Um, the, uh, the, there, is, there are programs there, there are opportunities um, uh, connected with Oliver Walcott and Votech area and the Suffield um, uh, agricultural program, the Asnantuck um, explorations that uh, we did in the last few years, um, but nowhere near enough. Um, I do think that part of what we should look at in this area is more discussion and better education and engagement with the parents. Um, the, there may be more opportunities that we could plug kids into or make available to the kids, but the kids don't know to ask and they may not be being encouraged by their parents to ask. And this might be a good example of where we've got a culture in this community, actually broader than Granby, that's developed that says you've got to go to four years of college. And, um, and I disagree with that. Um, I think it's created lots of problems for us. As I said a couple minutes ago, I think we need more than, probably need more than 12 years of public education. Um, so there's some blending of those uh, high school years and the community college years and, 
and vocational and technical um, directions, other directions people could go in. And uh, I would, I'd really like to spend more time looking into that in the future. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Sorry. can really know what to do on, the, on that front, but I, I'm hoping that our new superintendent will take that issue seriously and that it should come to him. But please let me know. I just wanted to make a few remarks on this. This is something that I actually feel very passionately about. Uh, I feel like we really need to push a focus on vocations. You know, we've got a lot of businesses in Connecticut that need workers. We've got a lot of students that are going to want jobs, people who don't want to go on to college. And that's great. That's perfectly fine. Let's find the right niche for them and find better ways to do that. I think we need to find a way to more effectively utilize our local companies that are looking for workers. We need to do something that sparks an interest in students that will help push them toward a vocation, working with their hands, something that they enjoy doing or processing. We need to find a way to discover that and, and, and light that fire. Um, I think this is a great opportunity to, to engage uh, more businesses who are looking for workers and, and help our students uh, expand their uh, interests beyond college. Thank you. Does anyone at table three have anything to add? Oh, sorry. Sorry, just real yep. quick. No problem. <clears throat> So my two older children that attended Granby Public Schools, my son decided to go to college. He was a good student. Um, the guidance counselors in the school helped him immensely on that path. A lot of counseling, a lot of interaction with his dad and I. My daughter chose a different path. She decided not to go to college right away and chose a vocational path. And I do feel like she was just kind of dropped at that point. So I do think there, there's a lot of work the Board of Education and, and other entities can do to help that. Someone from Table 3 would like to. As principal of East Granby High School, we were the first high school in the state of Connecticut to uh, design a fifth year program with his Nuntuck, which I think um, the Granby High School program is modeled on. And it's since been replicated all over the state. Uh, it's kind of an exciting program because students starting their junior year can go up to his Nuntuck, begin to take uh, classes up there and begin to work towards an associate's degree while they're finishing their high school requirements and with just one additional year of high school can earn an associate's degree in business and manufacturing and at that point because they have a degree from his Nantuck as long as they have a B average they have uh, an automatic guaranteed entry into the University of Connecticut or any of the state schools or they can go about right out into the workforce so it's kind of an exciting program and I think you're going to see more and more programs like that. Okay, this question is going to be directed at table two. It says, special education costs have increased and their percentage of the budget has also increased. How do you plan to keep the education of students who have these plans equitable to those who don't? Anyone who would like to begin, May? Thanks. Um, thank you. This, this is a really timely question um, because last year we did have an enormous overrun on special ed. Um, which also is impacting this year's budget. So it's, it's we're talking real time. How do we deal with this? There, there's not a lot you can do to to halt the cost of special ed um, as you're required by law to provide the services that the child is, needs, um, and and we have to foot the bill, whatever that is, and and we have to meet that obligation. Of course, it takes away from regular education. Absolutely. Um, and how do you try to serve those needs best? We did a massive um, review of the special ed program about seven, eight years ago, just when I was born, joining the board. It had just been completed. Um, I'm hoping that with our new superintendent, we can go back and look at how we're delivering special ed services. We got a, a very large report. We implemented a lot of the recommendations at that time. And it's my, my understanding that we've actually um, gone backwards now and are doing almost the same sorts of things now that we stopped doing eight years ago because we'd been told by a special ed consultant not to do. So either their advice was poor or we haven't been following it. I'm not sure which, but I think it's an area that we do need to take a very hard and close look at. How can we best deliver those services without um, having so much of the budget impacted um, from regular ed because clearly it's doing that right now. Thank you. 
Um, I think primarily you have to focus on the obligation of, of the board to provide uh, uh, as nearly equal advantages as may be practicable to all students. Um, obviously, the special education budget has, has been a, a, a huge factor in the, the entirety of the, of the, the Board of Education's budget. Um, perhaps one of the things that can better help navigate that in the future, and again, um, I, I, am, I am a newbie, uh, <laughs> just like Chris here, is, is perhaps communicating better with the community as what we anticipate future needs uh, what they might be. If we're aware of circumstances or situations that are developing in the future or particular issues that might be developing, perhaps that's something we can be aware of and plan better in the future. Um, but in the meantime, I think this is going to be an increasing problem uh, or concern uh, that is going to have to be anticipated and planned for. Thank you. So I guess I, I would approach this by trying to reconcile why we have decreased enrollment at the same time we have an uptick in special ed um, costs. And it, to me, it doesn't seem to make sense. I kind of want to understand how, why are the, the costs rising for special ed when we have, you know, lower enrollment? Um, I, when I was reading through the budget, there was a sentence that said, and it, it struck me, it said, in order to keep the overall budget increase close to the Board of Finance guidelines, Regular education expenses have been reduced in order to meet the increasing cost of special education. So I understand the need to do that. I understand the want to do that. Um, I, I struggle because obviously we want to support special education and we want to support things like um, the gifted and talented programs at the other end of the spectrum. Um, but the kids in the middle who are the average students that are the bulk of our, our, our children um, might get lost in the middle. I'm kind of afraid of this like middle child syndrome. You don't want to take away from them to add to the other two. So I just think it's something that should be looked at. Why are the costs rising when our enrollment's going down? Okay, thank you. Would anyone at table three like to add anything? I only have two thoughts on this. One, I do, uh, like others, hope that maybe a new superintendent with a fresh set of eyes might be able to give this a look and might have some experience or suggestions on areas where we might find some efficiencies. Another idea would be that uh, both West Hartford and Glastonbury found that uh, by doing some of these uh, services in-house was actually uh, less expensive. And I recognize that they're much larger districts, but maybe there'd be an opportunity regionally with some of the other local smaller districts to uh, find a way to, I don't know, regionalize some of these services and there might be some ways to save money there. Okay, thank you. Would anyone at table one like to add anything? I would just very quickly and to say again, let me assure everybody, nobody is getting lost in this process. Um, Jenny and I both sit on the um, finance subcommittee. This subject comes up every time we meet. Um, we watch it very, very closely in terms of ensuring that we are providing effective services to those kids who need them most in a way that doesn't impact the existing population. One of the things we can do and that we do do is are become advocates for the, the system as a whole with our other town leaders who have been very gracious in working with us and understanding the issue. So we have said to them in so many terms, you have to work with us to ensure that we're providing those kids who need the services the most what they need, but not at the expense of what we have to do for the rest of the kids in the district. So that is not happening. I appreciate that, Mark, because I couldn't get everything I wanted to say in to 45 seconds or whatever, so you did half of it. Um, the other half is, I, I think we, I just like to remind myself and remind everyone on this topic that one of the issues is that we measure these costs because there's a label attached. Um, we, don't, we don't measure a lot of other costs. There's all kinds of kids that get more than their share spent on them because they take more advantage of certain things, but we don't measure that. So um, it concerns me a little when we quickly note that. I, I realize we have to do it, but um, uh, what is equitable? If we are serious as a board about our values, um, and if we are serious about looking at things with an equity lens, which I think we are, then, we'll, then we need to get active at the state level to look for more um, region-wide uh, ways to uh, deal with the economic consequences of educa a fair education for all. 
Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Moving on, uh, this question is for table three. One of the board's goals is to provide a rigorous and diverse 21st century curriculum. How do you plan to make the curriculum divor uh, diverse and incorporate equity? Okay, okay. Can you go first? Sure. Sure. It's okay. a big question. Okay. <laughs> it is a big question, but it's one of, the, one of our main focuses on the board um, is uh, to look at our goals and our strategic planning and, um, and make sure that we have programs in place to implement them. Um, I, the first part of my answer would be that we rely heavily on the experts of our district, the educators, to uh, come to the board with programming that is rigorous and, um, and meets our goal of diverse 21st century curriculum. Um, recently, we've uh, been selected to participate in a pre-AP pilot program. Uh, this program uh, is uh, focused on uh, uh, English and math in our district in, in ninth grade. What this does is it, it increases the rigor of the math and English curriculum in ninth grade for all students. So we're looking at it also through that equity lens. So we're doing things like that. As other programs and other um, uh, opportunities arise, uh, our educators, our administrators bring it to our board and um, uh, certain programs come through specifically the curriculum subcommittee and then to the board at large and we look at um, what they can offer our students and we implement them uh, assuming that uh, it, our budget allows. Thank you. I think one of the ways that we can ensure equity is by demanding that every class have rigor, uh, regardless of the level of the class. Um, and uh, at East Granby, for instance, uh, when we still had to do the uh, capped exams, uh, everybody there was required to get a four on the exam in order to graduate, which was different than most other towns around the state. Uh, but, but because we had such a high standard and such rigor, students strive for that. and. You know, so students in a CP class, which was supposedly the easiest, were still striving for this very high benchmark. And so I think you create equity by making sure that there's rigor across the curriculum and everybody's getting a great education. Thank you very much. I now open the question to the other tables and I ask that only one member answer from each table just so we can stay on track with time. Table one. No one? Right. Table, table two? Anything? All right. Anything? Moving on to, nope. all right. This is a, a great question, um, and I can't let it run by, because for the last three years, I've been serving on the board's equity task force, um, and we've been meeting, in fact, we just met last night. Uh, this is really such an important issue, um, and it's a high focus for our district. We're really lucky that Ellen Adley and the board supported the equity task force. Um, their recommendations were made last spring, and we are trying to now implement and track them. Um, but obviously, it's until we, we have the achievement gap is narrowed, um, we can't let this rest. It's really important, and um, it's multifaceted. It's not, there is no easy answer. We would have done it already. Thank you very much. Okay, so switching over to the superintendent process. Granby is currently in the process of hiring a new superintendent. Do you feel the process is transparent? Why or why not? And I open this question to table one. Uh, the, I think the process is um, well laid out and uh, transparency is an element of it. Uh, people define transparency in different ways. We are dealing with personnel issues. We are dealing with people who are um, exploring leaving a current job for a future job, and there's a lot of confidentiality involved in that. Uh, the way that our process has been laid out and the way we're proceeding uh, makes me very comfortable, frankly. We reached out through a survey. Um, it got 350 
um, elements of input, of different people providing input, parents, teachers, and others, about what kind of qualities we're looking for in a superintendent. We've got a professional recruiter engaged to work with us. Um, we've got another meeting tomorrow night. As we work through things, we've got a good, um, a, a good number of applicants, and we will work through the process and be as transparent as is reasonably possible um, given the fact that, that uh, these are uh, confidential things that have to be treated carefully, um, uh, uh, you know, un until until the smoke rises and, and we find the right person, um, and we're going to find the right person. Uh, Alan Adley uh, taught us a lot, uh, and he's got big shoes to fill. And um, I, I think, uh, I, I, at least I, I can speak for myself. We're excited about this opportunity, and a little bit apprehensive. Um, I hope the public feels that they are getting the information they need about how the process is unfolding. Thank you. Yeah, just sort of build on that a little bit. So the, um, the surveys that we sent out, uh, we got a lot of information back. And what we did with the information was we developed a profile, which is going to be the single most important thing that we use to choose the superintendent. So we consolidated all of the comments and feedback we got to develop a series, and that's, I guess, what we're doing next time we meet, is to develop a series of questions based on the input that we got from the community. It's the single most important tool we have now in the process is the community um, input um, that we received. Um, so it's been very valuable. And again, kudos to your students, uh, Mike, because uh, when you look through the questions that they developed to ask us tonight, um, they parallel very closely the issues that were represented in the surveys and that are actually represented in the profile we put together to use in our selection process. So I think the process is working very well. And if anyone from tables two or three would like to give your input, you have 45 seconds. I would just say as a parent in the community, I feel as though the process has been incredibly transparent. Um, I read through the candidate profile and I thought it was outstanding, a very robust and comprehensive. Um, and I feel like the communication's been fantastic. Anyone from table three? Okay. Uh, we are now going to move into the relations with the town board. Uh, I'm directing this question to table two and the question is, do you feel that the Board of Education works well with other parts of town government? What recommendations do you have if you do not think they do? Um, I think the, the school board definitely works well with the town. Um, we have found areas of cooperation and, and I think we're all pretty determined to find more. There, there are areas we've highlighted um, that we would like to try to work with the town to improve our cooperation. Um, that's certainly something that we are willing to do and would like to do. I think another area is to find ways to cooperate with other towns. I mean, because not only do we duplicate services amongst our own town between us and, and the town garage and some of the other maintenance departments, but between towns, between East Granby, between Canton, between Suffield, there are opportunities where we can um, share costs and reduce duplication. I hope that we can find those ways um, as we go forward um, because I don't want the state to impose it, impose it upon us. I, I think that if it comes from us reaching out to our neighbors and finding those solutions, it would be a lot better um, for Granby. Thank you. Um, having not been a member of the Board of Education, it's hard for me to know exactly how they're, how they're all working together. Uh, from, from my limited perspective, especially in attending the budget meetings and such, it seems like com communication seems to be effective as far as getting things done. Um, uh, yeah, as I mentioned before, I think one thing that I would like to see more of is communication with the residents of, of Granby. And I think the, to tie it back to the prior question in regard to the superintendent search, I think that was a an example of effective communication with the community. So um, again, with my limited perspective, uh, there seems to be communication. I'm not sure how effective it is, and I'd like to see a broadening of communication with the residents. Thank you. My newbie status prevents me from commenting. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. No problem. All right, thank you. Uh, would anyone from table three like to add anything? Uh, table one. 
I'll give you the next one. <laughs> so this doesn't directly answer the question, but I, uh, one of the things that we are very fortunate in Granby is we have not yet um, fallen victim to the extreme partisan disease that um, um, seems to deadlock everywhere else in our government. So we disagree sometimes on our board. We disagree with members of the other board, but other boards in town. But at the end of the day, we sit down and we work out compromises and we work out solutions that are in the best interest of everybody. Um, and so I, I, we have a very, very good relationship with our other boards and amongst our own board because uh, we don't fall into that trap. Thank you. I just want to can I add one quick thing? Sure. The, the, this, is a, this is an important governance issue that not very many people in our community understand. Um, the Board of Ed has a lot of responsibility and very little authority. And if we don't work behind the scenes for good relationships with those other boards, we're not going to get anything done. So that's what we do. Thank you. Okay, we're now moving on to the final question of the evening, and this is in the category of school safety, and this is going to be asked to table three. Our question is, how do you propose we improve school safety in our district, and would you propose to change anything on the Board of Ed's existing school safety instructions and policies? Open up to table three. Um, we have, as a district, we've taken several measures uh, throughout the years, the last few years in particular, to ensure the safety of our students. Um, our professionals, our teachers have been trained, our administrators have been trained. We've taken um, some security measures in terms of um, our building and facilities. Uh, we have the man trap at uh, the high school uh, or that's being worked on and, and in the middle school and Wells Road and, and Kelly. Um, so those are um, some physical features that you can see in terms of the security measures that we put in place and those were through a grant. Uh, we also work very closely with our first responders in town to ensure the safety of our students. Um, again, I said staff training. Um, we also have uh, every year before the start of school, there is a, a, a mass catastrophe um, sort of um, um, training that goes on. And uh, we're continuing to look at other ways that we can make sure that our students are safe. There's other certain safety features that we're not really at liberty to discuss because they would compromise your safety, um, but that is something that is very important to the board to make sure that all of our students um, feel safe when they enter the buildings. Thank you. So you can imagine as a building principal for seven years, especially the past seven, we spent a, a great deal of time uh, thinking and, and practicing this. Uh, in addition to the, the physical features like the man trap and, and that kind of thing, and that's where you have the, the double entry for all the entries to the school. Uh, I think that uh, probably an underestimated area is mental health. So you need to continue to support the mental health of students, make sure there's adequate school psychologists, social workers, and that people are trained, you know, basically if you hear something, you see something, say something, you know, let somebody know that somebody's really having some issues and make sure that that information gets out there and that needs to be part of the, the overall training for the students and families and staff. Okay, thank you very much. Would anyone from table one like to contribute anything? I do have to comment because I spent my career in public sector risk management for cities and schools all over the country. Um, so uh, we, we keep our eye on this. Uh, just the one thing I want to mention that I haven't heard is um, an awful lot of what, needs, what we need to continue to work on is, a culture, is the cultural issue. We can work on the facilities, we can give everybody the Stop It app so that they feel that um, they can report things. But we need to have a culture. I think we have that culture now. We need to make sure that we encourage and support a continued culture where kids aren't afraid to speak up if they have a concern, that they know that there's somebody they can go to if they have a concern. Um, and uh, and in, a, in a community like Granby, we ought to be able to count on that. Thank you. Would anyone from table two like to add anything? I would just add that I searched 
for a school safety policy or instructions and I couldn't find any. So maybe if they do exist, maybe we can make them more easily found. Okay, thank you. Sure. <laughs> This is a, an area where it, I mean, it, it strikes such fear in our hearts. Um, it, it, you could spend our entire budget on school safety, and it would never be enough. Um, you cannot prevent the, the tragedies that we've seen. Um, what you can do is try to minimize how awful they are. But it is the one area where I think all of us would be like, oh, whatever it takes. I mean, just do it. We, and, and that's a really terrifying place to be in. But it, it gets us back to one of our other questions, and that's town cooperation. And I want to point out just how phenomenal the cooperation has been between the school board and our town youth services to try to assist kids who are in, in, in a bad place, um, need some help, need some support. And that is an area where, where we've been cooperating, and hopefully it will make us safer. OK, thank you. That concludes our questions for the forum tonight. So I would like to invite the registrar of voters up so we can ask them a, question, so a couple of questions for uh, National Voter Registration Day. Registration Day. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. So I, I offered Ask Me Anything. Do you guys have any questions you want to ask me? Yes, of course. All right. <laughs> what isn't there to ask about voting? Um, my first question is Can 17 year olds register and vote in Granby? So the answer is sort of yes. <laughs> because you can vote in a primary if you're 17 and you're registered and you're in a member of a major party. So for um, 2019, we didn't have a primary. But if you're 17 now, you can get registered right now for the November 5th election if you're going to be, if you were born by November 5th, 2001. Now for next year, this is exciting. The Connecticut presidential preference primary will be on April 28th. I hope you all will plan on getting excited about that. If you were born by November 3rd, 2002, you can participate if you register with a major party and you have until noon to decide which one you want to participate in. So that's exciting. And yes, I encourage all 17-year-olds to register to vote. Perfect. Thank you very much. They can do it here at the school. The forms are in the office. But of course, you can also go online because we're in a new age where it's so convenient to get registered to vote. If you're doing it online, I just would like to point out they're looking for an ID number. So if you have a driver's license, please be sure to add that. If you don't know your, if you're not a driver, uh, use your social security. But put an ID number in and it'll make the process go a little faster. Okay, so since we can register to vote, um, how would I get a voter registration ID card? So other states have that. They have voter registration ID cards, and people are required to bring them to the polls. We don't do that in Connecticut. We haven't had a voter registration ID card in many, many years. Um, we're very open to any kind of photo ID that you might want to bring to the polls. Um, we have one voter registration form, and if you're new, brand new, if you're changing your address, your name, your party, it's all the same form. We make it so easy. So um, no cards, just the form. If you want to make a change, please fill one out and send it to us or go online and make the changes. OK. Um, don't you have to vote the party line if you registered with the party? And how much does it cost to be a party member? You would be surprised how many times we get that question. Uh, party membership is free. I encourage everyone to have a voice in how their leaders are chosen. And right now, the Republicans and the Democrats have a very strong voice in who's going to be on the ballot and who's going to be elected. I encourage if you don't want to choose a major party, there are many minor parties as well. But uh, they have no. Um, restrictions or obligations once you choose a party. 
So I um, encourage you to do that. There's no cost associated with it. If you are a me member of a major party, then you get the extreme privilege of being able to vote in a primary. But we are a closed primary state, so you can't vote in a primary unless you're a member. And you have 90 days to switch if you see somebody on the other side that you'd rather be voting for. So um, the deadline is coming up January 28th, 2020, if you want to switch parties. Um, if you're a member of the Independent, Green, Libertarian, or any other minor party, that will apply as well. So 90 days. Um, but I encourage everyone to support their local parties. That's where all these wonderful candidates came from. We are nonpartisan in town, and I really think you find the best people when you go to the town committees and you talk to the parties. So it's a great thing to do. Okay, I was wondering how often I need to renew my voter registration. We get this all the time. We have some people who send in a voter registration card every year. We don't mind. We'll send you a letter. We'll let you know, yep, you're all set. But you don't ever have to renew your voter registration once you're registered if the post office or the DMV tells us that you, you know, haven't moved. If they do that, we are required to move you along. So if you go to the DMV and you change your driver's license and say you're living in another town for whatever purpose, you're going to get a letter from us saying, hey, we don't think you live in Granby anymore. If the post office thinks you moved, you're going to get a letter from us saying, we think you've moved. No problem. Just send that letter back within 30 days. We'll get it straightened out. We'll get you all fixed. If you don't reply to us, then you're on the inactive list. And while you can still vote, you have to be reinstated at the polls and you need to fill out another registration form. So I encourage everyone to, if you suspect your registration isn't perfect, ask us, do it online, send us a form. We're happy to process you as many times as you need to be reassured. We just had a lady who sent in her registration, what, two times in one day? It's okay. We'll take care of her. <laughs> okay, thank you. Last question of the night, what are my early voting options? So you hear a lot about that, early voting. They're always talking about it. It's a big issue nationally. Connecticut does not have early voting. Our Constitution prevents that. We're all about all going out to the polls on election day, if you're able, and uh, standing up and, and voting um, with your peers. But the Constitution does provide very specific reasons why you can vote by mail. So the town clerk will accept applications for a mailed-in um, uh, absentee ballot. And I encourage, if you need one, to go get one. Um, the requirements are, though, um, specific. So um, military service, physical disability, religion, illness, you're working at the polls in another town, or you're absent all the hours of the day. So those are your options if you can't be here in Granby to come here, right here to the high school to vote. Thank you. And finally, we would like to introduce our civics teacher, Michael Dombrowski, for his closing remarks. Thank you. How about we give a big round of applause for the candidates? And another round of applause for all the students responsible for tonight's forum, both on stage and off stage. I, I personally would like to thank the candidates for taking time out of their busy schedules to allow my students to participate um, in the democratic process. Thank you to Laura uh, Wolf uh, for your patience with this motivated and dedicated group of 17 and 18 year olds. It's events like these, with students like these, that make Granby a destination and endpoint for families uh, like myself and those out here. Our, our founding fathers, who the students will be reading next week in Federalist 10, uh, would be very proud of the hard work that these students have put into tonight's forum. And despite what some media outlets want you to believe, the future of our democracy is bright and not dark. Uh, thank you to the audience members and those watching at home. Uh, thank you to Rodney Scudder, the Social Studies Department Chair, Principal Dunn, and the Central Services Administration 
for embracing local government and project-based learning in our curriculum. If candidates could remain on stage, the student journalists will come to you for interviews um, and questions to, that they will then send to the Granby Drummer, as well as the school newspaper, and this will be our version of the spin room. Uh, the spin room, which occurs after the presidential forums and debates. To everyone out there, thank you for a good night, um, and watch out for the mosquitoes on your way home.